Perfect Spy by John le Carré. Dramatised for radio by Robert Forrest. Episode 3. Good, Sir Magnus. Now you are unarmed, and I have a Russian-made gun aimed at the belly of a British imperialist soldier and spy. Let me enjoy this situation for just a little while. Am I under arrest? Or are you going to kill me? Just a second or two more. Ah, all right, enough. See, I place my gun on the table beside yours. Now, we push both weapons aside and we replace them with one bottle of vodka... Two glasses, sausage, gherkins, and black bread. Please, be seated. Let us do it. Do we talk nonsense and save the world a little? <laughs> Sir Magnus, you remember. Of course. You're unforgettable. What the hell are you doing here? Sit, drink, eat, talk. So what did we talk about all those years ago, in a barn near the border between Austria and Czechoslovakia? Axel told me something of what happened to him after being arrested in Bern. The Swiss marched him into Germany. German police dealt him a ritual beating. On receipt of him from the Germans, the Americans beat him again. Among the false papers he'd once carried were those of a Nazi war criminal. But war crimes were becoming old hat, so they threw him onto a train into Czechoslovakia where he was beaten for having been a German soldier during the war, and then beaten again for having been an American prisoner after the war. But time passes. It does that, even when your bones are so pummeled they don't heal anymore. You learn how to use the party to advance yourself. You learn which asses to kick and which to kiss. You rise. You achieve position. You gain access. You did all that? Yes, I have kicked and kissed and denounced. But you, Sir Magnus, those years ago in Bern, what happened to you? I told him how agonised everyone had been when he disappeared. I told him I'd gone to the police, waving my British passport, until two men in raincoats told me to disappear fast or I'd disappear. I told him I'd gone to the British embassy. A friend there was sympathetic, but nothing they could do. Frau Ollinger was convinced there'd been an informant... She went through many suspects, neighbours, shopkeepers, one of the other poor beggars who'd passed through her friendly house. Who did Axel think it might have been? A fish gets a hook in its throat, a traitor gets a bullet in the head. An illegal, which I was, gets marched across the border. These are things that happen. But here's another thing that happens. I was ill and you nursed me. I yelled at you and cursed you. You held my head when I threw up. Yes, Generous hearts, they happen too. And you, Sir Magnus, I never knew a better heart. And here's another thing. After you've disappeared... What? I took your books back to the library. Excellent. Have another drink. Speaking of books, the Simplicissimus I gave you, have you sold it? Of course not. It's precious to me. And you to me, my child. Do you want it back? Of course not. I have my own. Let's hold on to both copies. So, here we both are. With half a bottle still to drink. <laughs> here we are. I'm Lieutenant Pym. But who are you? I'm here to meet a defector. Are you coming across to us? <laughs> my country is not perfect, but I've crossed my last frontier. What then? What do they teach you in so-called British intelligence? You've never heard of a defector in place? Glance at that. Is this? Genuine, yes. A bit out of date, but useful to have. It's the Soviet order of battle in Czechoslovakia. I could go on defecting in place for years. I could make you famous, Sir Magnus. Well, perhaps not famous in our secret little world. But a man with a highly regarded source is highly regarded himself. 
By the time I turned up with a breakdown of the total Soviet air strength in Czechoslovakia as of November 1951, I was a cult of one, and to know me was to be an insider. London on the scrambler, they're sending it to the top. Every female in the know, any age, they all gave me the smile and the nod. That man Pym, the captain was heard to say. National serviceman, matters not a jot, give him a third pip, my view. Then after about a year of this secret fame, Axel was limping around the barn like a ghost of the ghost he was. It is a purge. They are arresting people all over, arresting my friends, and they're pointing at me, questioning me. So I had to tell them about us. Us? I had to. You told them about me? Not in detail, not your name, but I had to say, yes, of course I go across the border. I'm a spy, it's what I do. I say to them, I've hooked a big British fish. I'm reeling him in. I'm not a big fish, Axel. You have to become one. They're demanding proof. What kind of proof? Secrets, of course. Product, intelligence. It has to be real. It has to be good. If you don't... Yes, you'll be pummeled again. (laughs) Pummeled? They'll have the balls off me and then it'll be a bullet in the head. I'm in my major's office. His desk is an old tin affair, in the back of which are four screws, and my Swiss army knife makes short work of them. Third drawer down on the left-hand side, beneath a lavishly illustrated brown fish of the world and a classified telephone directory, I find the Order of Battle of Military Intelligence in Vienna. I use my army issue act for camera, with a one-foot measuring chain fastened to the lens front. I work quickly and smoothly, without doubt or fear. This is what I was born for. This is a divinely ordained mission. In the beginning was the spy. Sir Magnus, we are founding our own country with a population of two. But please... Promise me you will never bring me anything this good again. If you do, they will make me a general, and we shall not be able to meet any more. So why did I do it, Jack? That first raid on the Major's desk, of course, we might say was to save Axel's life. But again, and again and again, certainly I was not a partisan for Czechoslovakia, for the Soviets, or for communism. And remember... Over the years, I've done as much for you and for the firm as I did for Axel. I've served both my masters well. I can imagine your sneer if I said I did what I did to be a champion of the common ground. But consider this touching little scene. The year before I gave Axel my first British secrets. The evening I first found him in the barn with his Russian gun and Russian vodka. When we left the barn and stepped into the late summer dusk, The fox, Sir Magnus, is wishing us well. Ah, Ah, look. Look here, harvest poppies. One for you, Sir Magnus, and one for me. There is only one of me and only one of you. And there will never be another of either. Now we embrace... I've changed my mind. About what? The poppies. You keep both of them. Be the keeper of our friendship. Axel. Why? I don't mean... I know what you mean. I always do. Why? Maybe I hate that my country is run by Russian thugs. Or maybe to be a champion of the middle ground. How long have I been the keeper of the poppies? How long has it taken me to get here with my father's filing cabinet and the embassy burn box? That meeting in the barn was... what? Early fifties? Good God. It's taken me three decades to reach this room. Where are you, Magnus? I cannot imagine where you might be. I am your wife, and I can conjure up no surroundings in which you're visible, recognisable, 
visiting Tom at his school. Magnus, I can't even imagine you with our son. And here, in our home in Vienna, that door there through which you've walked so many hundreds of times, even that I cannot imagine. But Jack is after you, Magnus. If anyone can find you, it's Jack Brotherhood. When did you last hear from him? No sugar, Jack. I remember. Belinda, he's in trouble. Biscuits? This biscuit drum was a wedding present. Can you believe that, Jack? All those years, and I still use it. Did he phone you on Monday night from a call box? His father came to our wedding. He wasn't invited, but he turned up. Like a cross between the Lord Mayor and a gangster. He led us outside, and there was our Richard Pym wedding gift. A brand new Jaguar, white ribbons tied to the bonnet. Then back inside, and Ricky Pym was the life and soul. He made a lovely speech, and he and Magnus sang underneath the arches. I never saw him again. I never saw the Jaguar again either. His father's dead. Heart attack. A week ago. I know. Magnus said sometimes there was a gleam in his father's eye, like a flick knife. Do you still get flick knives? You know the father's dead because Magnus phoned you on Monday night. Why would he? I'm the first wife from the dim and distant and with no children. You ever hear of a Sabina? A film star? What about Poppy? No. And do you think I'd care about his women? I haven't even spoken to him since Mary became wife number two. I think you have, Belinda. Monday night. The biscuits are good, Jack. From a French place in Hampstead. He was drunk. Or maybe not. He said he loved me for trying so hard. To make him happy, I suppose, happy with me. But that was impossible. I couldn't keep up with him, all those changes of his. He'd come home as one person, I'd try to match him, and next morning he'd be someone else. The strangest thing, he said Monday night, he said he wished we'd had a baby, a girl. I'd have been a wonderful mother to a daughter. If he'd been here, I'd have slapped him. Then it was, thank you, Belinda, forgive the bad bits, and he was gone. Anyone else you can think he might fall? Mm, the Samaritans? <laughs> the Russian embassy? Or oh, you could try Seth. Sir Kenneth Sefton Boyd? Old school friend, 20 years an MP, high Tory, degenerate. And you think Magnus might have turned to this knighted degenerate? I think Magnus considered Seth his equal in some odd way. So he might have gone to him, to hide out. If the situation was bad enough. Jack, if Magnus is hiding out, if he's turned into someone you don't know and don't trust, you've only yourself to blame. He'd have been all right if he'd never met people like you. Hmm. You sure you won't have a drop of this brandy, Inspector? I could offer you something stronger, but you might feel obliged to arrest me. Monday night, Sir Kenneth. A phone call from Magnus. Pissed out of his skull. Went on and on about some chap called Brotherhood, Scottish, ferreting after him. Is that you, by any chance? Inspector Marlowe? Real name? Alternative name? Thought so. Anyway, there's you, the jock, and there's the other who's foreign. The jock's running Magnus, Magnus is running the other. Can that be right? Couldn't follow it all. So pissed he was weeping. I told him to come here, get dried out and rested. And then he started on about his ghastly old man. Sir Kenneth, the foreigner. Mm. Told you all he told me. Oh, no, hold on. He was a cripple, that was Magnus's fault. Then he's confessing a more grievous fault. He was the little bugger who carved my initials in the staff laboratory at school. There's no need, I always knew it was him. Monday night, Sir Kenneth, you invited him here. Well, I could get a word in, on and on about that damned father of his. Seemed to come well down in the world, died in some beastly little basement flat. No money for a funeral or a coffin. Had him laid out in the bath, covered in ice. But that wasn't the worst. There was worse to tell me. Not sure if he could even say it out loud. And he didn't. He hung up on me. You asked him to come here. Did he? Is he here now? Maybe I should take a look around. Got a warrant? No. Well, get one and I might let you have a wander. But all you'll find is a rather tough young man in my bed. 
You start to wander without the warrant, the tough young man will come at my call. Jack has left two babysitters with me, Magnus. I'll see your two and raise you three. You're a bold one. Georgie and Fergus. They're playing cards for matches. Show me what you've got. Damn. I am boldly cleaning you out. When I was their age in Berlin, I was conning room keys out of hotel maids. I was returning stolen files to dangerous desks. You all right there, Mary? I was sobering up raving agents in disgusting safe houses. Mary? I'm fine. Good book. Nice binding. Do that yourself? No. Sure you don't want us to deal you in? No, thanks. You knew I was good, Magnus. So did Jack. Valued my coolness and my sharp eye. And if I could get away from these children... I might have as much of a chance of finding you as Jack does. Oh, this is awful. And you're an awful bluffer. I have the coolness and the eye. I have the skill and the know-how to find you. But I am being babysat to death. Mummified. My true official work for the firm, for you, Jack, began, I suppose, in the late 50s, with several bizarre interviews in Oxford and London. Will you adore your country, right or wrong, so help you God and the Tory party? I would, of course. All right with in peril of life, or steer clear at all costs? Love a taste of danger, actually. We have bits and bobs in Kenya and the Sudan. How do you feel about abroad? Travel I consider super, actually. Don't keep saying actually. Ah, but, 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 you speak Czech. Uh, Not my strongest suit, sir. Never mind, we'll have you brush up and send you in. Sell some of the red ruffians useful but harmless items and spy on all the rest. Now, tell us a bit about your somewhat dubious father. But as I'm sure you'll understand, Jack, Rick was no liability. A healthy streak of criminality and a young spy's background never did him any harm. So a week before I left for Prague, I took the dubious father out to dinner. You know, son, I was just uh, yesterday thinking about that day we had in... uh... Where was it? <laughs> I took you out of school and uh, rode you down to... Oh, no, by the sea. It's a quiet little place. Uh, we ate fish and chips and we played football on the sand and rode our bikes there too. I remember. I, I should hope so. You said that day was crackerjack. Best day ever. You even said perfect. You used that very word. Perfect day. Mm. And uh, you know what else we did? That day we talked about the future, my future and yours, our future. And here it is, and it's far from perfect, is it? A travelling salesman, that the best my boy can do. It's a start. Not much of one selling electric razors to foreign but, commies. I mean, check us the back here. It's all beetroot and not, brief. Not razors, father. Alternators, oscillators, and modern stuff. Listen to me, son. You might be paying for this meal like a real grown-up, but I paid for your education. Yes, that's uncomfortable, Best father. school going. Yes. You My should arm. stuck to the law, be the highest in the land. It hurts. Or are you hurts. mixed up in some racket over there in the commie land? What are you up to? Tell me. Go! Go! It was Farley Abbott, and we didn't play football, it was cricket. I know what that means, that tapping on your glass. It means somebody fill this up for me. It reminds me how you used to unlace your shoes and then sit back and wait for someone to fetch your slippers for you. Well, well indeed. You really do think you're all grown up. I am. Grown up and talking back. Think you can best your old man, boy? Can't be done. Even killing me isn't enough. No, he didn't say that. Not about killing. He couldn't have. That was much later. No, it wasn't. He never said it at all any time. He looked it. It was in his eyes. Why is this room so cold? The window might ice up. Why is outside as quiet as emptiness? 
The agency position overall on this is that we have the previously known accumulation of indicators. It blips on your computers, examined last year, discounted as very likely no more than coincidence. Indicators from a wide range of sources. And some entirely new data. A review of first indicators, coded transmissions from the Czech Embassy in Washington over a period of three years show periodic discontinuation. These periods of discontinuation match periods of absence from Washington of Magnus Pym. Uh, and when Magnus returned, the transmission started up again, saying, welcome home. Or pointing a finger, false incrimination. The Czechs have tried that before, in Berlin, here in London. The transmissions have been subjected to new analytic methods, searching for evidence of a non-random text that would serve as the key base for transposition. A pattern has emerged, a logical linguistic progression. Are we straying into the mystical here, or quantum physics? He means a code book. Two agents communicate using a single text known only to them. There are new indicators, abstracted from the record of travel of Magnus Pym while deputy head of station in Washington. His visits to 11 American cities have been met. And nine of those cities received a visit on the same days from this man. Look at these. Face familiar to any of you? Comical looking fellow. That could be a clown's moustache. I remember those twinkly eyes. He's a journalist and... Um... Pets? Correct. Hans Albert Petz, Czech journalist. Also Jerry Zavorsky. Same man. Also a journalist. West German, but of Czech origin. And Alexander Hamble, Czech intelligence officer. Same man again. And in the same American cities at the same time as your PIM on at least nine occasions. Magnus took a holiday on Lesbos a few months ago. Petz, Hamble, Zaworski was there too. You told me that was all right. Oh, so he is, he is, but he has to stay undercover for a while. No. Look at this. That's him. That's who? The old man on Lesbos, the one with the limp. The one Dad met at the cricket match. In your dad's letter to you, he mentioned a book you should read someday. Tells us the world is mad and getting madder. But we can still be happy and free. Simply... Simply Sissimus. That's it, yeah. Your mum mentioned it, too. Read it yet? No. Even my German master hasn't read it yet. And Uncle Sid, your dad says you can always go to Uncle Sid. Never heard of this uncle. He's not really my uncle. Sid Lemon. He was a friend of Grandad's. Looked after Dad when he was small. And if Dad's all right, why have the police been here? Why was an inspector from Scotland Yard here in the school asking about him? So there I was, Tom, happy and free in a world gone mad and getting madder, roving around late 50s Czechoslovakia, filling up my order book for best of British electrical equipment. And at the same time, I was photographing forbidden sites, collecting documents from behind cisterns and behind loose stones in graveyard walls, leaving money in their place, and talking to furtive men in stinking dives and respectable hotels. The next bit of the story you should enjoy, Tom, it's a bit of an adventure and has a gun in it. You, Jack, should appreciate the tradecraft. How quickly I assessed the situation and knew instantly what role to play. The story begins as I return to my room in one of those quiet hotels. Stand still, raise your hands. Magnus Richard Pym. Good God. You are charged with espionage, provocation of the people and incitement to treason. It's ridiculous. I'm a salesman. You have been under surveillance since you entered our country. Give the gun to me. Sir, I demand to see the British consul. Search his room, but don't remove anything. Yes, sir. Now, you will turn around and walk slowly out to the corridor. Turn left towards the service stairs. Outrageous. Move! Don't leave here till you receive orders from me. Sir. This is not only outrageous, it's scandalous. Just drive, take the next left. Does your brutal regime want scandal in the British and American papers? My government will insist on more than an apology. Exposure, punishment. A very good Englishman might almost be taken for genuine outrage. You're going to shoot me while I'm driving? And what if I swerve off the road, crash the car? I may well survive, but you will certainly be dead. Take the next right and drive slowly. Vodka. Bread, sausage, gherkins... And no microphones, as in hotel rooms and cars. Hmm. 
So, Sir Magnus, once upon a time a barn, now a ruined summer house. By the way, they have a photograph of you and me coming out of that barn. They want me to blackmail you. You must spy for us again. If you don't agree, they'll hang you. They'd rather hang an American, but an Englishman is a decent second best. They might well hang me, too. What will they find in your room? Only I can get you out of this. You don't trust me? You haven't put down the gun. Uh, Sir Magnus, I'm so, so sorry. Here, you take it. Let's put it on the table, Axel. Film, secret ink, code books, blueprints and other papers in the lid of my suitcase. A talcum powder tin that's a camera. An escape map in the lining of a tie and $5,000. No atom bomb? <laughs> Here. Cheers, Sir Magnus. Good health, Axel. You look as if you could use some. Ah. Oh, I've been back in a couple more prisons and hospitals since you saw me last. Four years? Five? But behold, I am risen. And you too must rise. We will rise together. I look after your career and you look after mine. We go for the biggest diamonds in the biggest banks. What do you... You mean America? How can we be fully risen till we've spied on the land of the free? We take our revolution to them and bring some of their riches to us. And we meet in the middle ground. Yes, in our own country with a population of two. Both champions. I'm not sure I have it in me to go stealing British secrets again, let alone American. Of course you have. You are a searcher. You have betrayed much. I know you have betrayed me. Excellent. I've always known. But the new nature has produced a perfect match. That good heart of yours and your gift for lying. Often when you lie, Sir Magnus, you are telling the truth. What a gift that is. You are a perfect spy. All you need is a cause. I have it. Prisons, torture, lies. Our revolution is young and the wrong people are running it. We pursue freedom and build too many prisons. We pursue peace and make war. But in the long run, Magnus, we could make a society that will never again produce sad little fellows like you. Or tall, skinny, broken ones like you. <laughs> Excellent. Perfect. So, we sit, drink, eat, and we make a new world together. We rise together. And now I say it. You are a good man. And I love you. If, therefore, ye have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if ye have not been faithful in that which is The English mammon, church in Vienna. Who will give you that? Congregation. Which is your own? Diplomats and their wives, military personnel and their wives, a few locals in Out of the Cold. Maybe like this one behind me, leaning too close. Georgie's at least seven pews away, gazing at the handsome young minister, but always, always with an eye on me. And this old man, I know he's old, is leaning closer still. I can smell... Stale cigar, peppermint, and illness. I can help you find him. I will send a message to the house. This is the address of that uncle who isn't an uncle. Sid Lemon. Well done, Kate. Whoever visited Tom's school wasn't a friend, not the firm and not the police. Your position, the checks. Do you still think the checks are Magnus's opposition? That Magnus is somehow or other still straight, one of us? I've known him since he was 16. But you're no longer sure. A book, a German, Simplicissimus. Have it checked out as the possible core book, the non random text, as the Yanks called it. Logical linguistic progression. Right, and don't ask stupid questions. Of course I'm not sure. You can never be sure. It's a book to be rebound, that's all. 
recovering letter, Mary? Just a notice from B. Lederer, a friend. May we see the note? How polite of you to ask. Nice book. The Art of Painting by C.A. de Fresnoy. Dear Mary, picked this up for pennies and wondered whether you would like to bind it for me. How much would you get for a job like this? Usual fee, she says here. Full hide, buckram, and the title printed in gold capitals between the first and second band on the spine. Knows what she wants, eh? B usually does. Now, you've read the letter, held it up to the light, you've rifled through all the pages in the book, so unless you want to take it away for X-ray, may I get on with my work? It was you who taught me to do this, Magnus, back in Berlin, when we were using a bookshop as a dead letterbox. Use a damp rag to soak off the end paper. A book this age, the original glue would be animal and would have crystallised. But this isn't the original. It's been replaced. Stuck on with flour paste. Responds quickly to water. Yes. Here it comes. That note wasn't from B. Not her handwriting. And she wouldn't know buckram from plastic. Now for the board. Scalpel. Modern millboard disintegrates easily like dry earth. Easy. Easy. And here it is. Same handwriting. In the afternoon, between two and six, take coffee in Café Mozart. Mr. Koenig will collect you. Berlin in the 60s, Jack. Oh, what a time we had. In the vibrant, terrifying capital of the Cold War. You and I ran agents of influence... Agents of disruption, of sabotage and disinformation. We ran smugglers and tunnelers, listeners and watchers, and forgers and couriers, seducers and assassins. And all the time, Axel and I exchanged our film and our documents, and every new year we drank and toasted, next year in America. And it was in Berlin, Tom, that I met and courted and married your mother. In fact, I took her away from her boss and mine, Uncle Jack. Did you know that? She's been a wonderful mother to you, an excellent cover for me. Not that there wasn't love, but that came later. Of course, in Berlin, you could be roused from your bed at three in the morning and driven to a police station by two men in leather jackets who might be very special policemen indeed. It happened to me. God in heaven, son! Oh, they've picked you up as well? No. The Commandant recognised the name. I'm here to get you out. Well, thank the Lord for that! Look at the toilet they throw me in. And nothing to eat but stinking German sausage. What kind of country is this? I'm an honest man doing honest business. They were trying to sell aeroplanes. One aeroplane, a wartime classic. Wellington. Perfect, Nick. No, oh, well, mainly I've been dealing in fur coats. Mm. Yeah. You, 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 you can really get me out. What would be the point of having a son in the foreign office if you couldn't get you out of a foreign toilet? Oh, God, oh, yeah. A great, warm, great, great hug here. <laughs> now listen, Father. Not just out of this place, out of the city, out of the country. It has to be that way. You get me back to England, son, and I'll never leave it again. Ladies. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Now, the Diplomatic Wives Club's lunch at Manzi's is next Monday, 12.30 sharp, 400 shillings a head. Cash, please. Oh, and, and that includes two glasses of wine? Oh, of course it does, Marjorie. <laughs> Thank you. Before we go any further, I simply must say something about Mary's loss, her father-in-law. Yes, we know Magnus has been hit very hard, Mary. Yes, very hard. <laughs> do, you, do you know when he might be back am among us? Um, Mary? You don't mind us mentioning this. <laughs> Mary? Oh. Are you all right? Uh, I'm so sorry. Oh, this is absurd, uh, but I, I think I'm oh. going to... Please, excuse me. Oh, oh dear. Mary. She... Oh, my dear Mary. 
Was Magnus so very close to his father? No, not not for a long... Oh, dear God, Caroline, this is beyond ridiculous. Hush, now. What about a little lie down? It's just that his father's business has turned out to be... Oh, that doesn't matter. Oh. Uh, no, thanks. Not a lie down. Maybe okay. uh, a walk in your back garden. Mm -hmm. Fresh air. Excellent, Norton. Just the thing. Mm. You'll need your coat. And my bag, too, please. Fergus and Georgie can sit out front and watch my car for hours, if they want. Here's the garden. There's the path. Walk it, slowly, until it dips me out of sight. Then move, fast, but don't run, to the gate, to the road, to the bus stop. There's one every 14 minutes. I know. I looked them up. Training. Nothing quite like it for cooling the blood. I know this technique. We called it paper chasing in Berlin. How to make an encounter with someone you don't trust. And of course, I am not to be trusted. The Mozart Cafe. Half empty. But someone will have watched me arrive. Will be watching still to see if I've been followed. Take note of everyone around me. Look out the big window often for any sign of a stakeout. I should have worn a hat to seem more like a respectable single woman. Frautin? Yes. Herr Koenig is very sorry. He, he left this note for you. Thank you. Pay bill and leave cafe. Turn right. Walk slowly, admiring shop windows. Frau Pim, I am from Herr Koenig. Uh, please follow. All senses are light. I smell frost and delicatessen and petrol and tobacco and fear. Turn left, turn right, turn right again, then across a square and a brown Peugeot is waiting. You will get in, please, Frau Pim. Get out now, Frau Pim. You walk to end of street, turn left. First entrance is to jeweler shop. Pause to look in window. Third entrance is to apartment building. Go in. In lobby will be tall woman in black coat. If she carries nothing, go home. If she carries rolled newspaper, take lift to apartment six. I shall repeat. End of street, left, jeweler's window, third entrance, black coat, no newspaper. I go home, newspaper there, I take lift to six. You are good. Frau Pim. It's the training. You are a courageous woman, Mrs. Pim. Who are you? Where is Magnus? I don't know where he is, but I have been your husband's friend since he was 16 years old. Jack Brotherhood, of course, has known him just as long. Now, if I... We, if we find Magnus, he will be made safe and he will be rewarded. But if Jack Brotherhood finds him, he will be punished. Hard. He will be in an English prison for the rest of his life. I'm not a policeman, Mr. Lemon. You stroll about like a copper. You smell like one. Like a soldier, I'm a friend of Magnus's. Brotherhood. Never heard Titch had a pal like you. Never heard of such a name come to that. You've got a Union Jack and a Paul in your front garden. Scarecrow. Keeps away foreigners and cops. Don't always work. That flag is my line of business. Right. Not a kind of copper. It is what I'll do for you. You tell me what you want and I'll tell you to piss off. Is that fair? Listen, you old crook. <laughs> Mind my heart. Sid Lemon, Uncle Sid. You've been bending and breaking the law since you were a titch yourself. Not as good as an uncle. You've done time. Line of duty. 
Due to Sir Magnus's vicious con man death. He was a genius. Who's Poppy? Oh, no idea. Who's Sabina? A racehorse. What made that mark on the carpet? Hmm? Here, in the corner. The fairies. There was a heavy bit of furniture here until very recently. And the tyre tracks in your drive a lorry to haul away whatever was in this corner. What was it? And where's it gone? America. America at last. America in the 70s, Jack. And Axel and I romping through all the states like thieving children and thieving from children. The Yanks truly are open-hearted and so open-handed with their secrets. Hey, Magnus, that naval attaché of yours has been angling for a look at this for months. Keep it quiet, old buddy. So the attaché had a look, and London had a look, and Prague had a look. Axel was a boyish pilgrim. He insisted we visit the Space Museum and Disneyland and the statue of Nathan Hale, the patron saint of spies, hanged by the British. Last words, I only regret I have but one life to lose for my country. How many lives did we have, Axel and I, to sacrifice for our country of two? From Washington, I flew and trained and drove to New York, Boston, New Orleans, Dallas, many others. And in too many cities I was traced and followed and found and trapped. It's the best you can do for me, a grubby little diner. It's clean enough. They can't make a decent chip. And you look out of place with the fancy tailoring and the posh accent. Education and the company I keep. Reminds me, how's Uncle Sid these days? I haven't seen Sid Lemon in years. You know where I'm living now, son. A new high-end development on the edge of the city, but only because they let the right kind of people settle in rent-free for two months, you know, inducement to buy. High-end maybe, but not a home. What's a home, man? Underneath the arches? And uh, when do I get to meet this grandson of mine? I know how you do this. I can do it because I can still put on the show. I turn up at their offices and I'm still the right kind of people. But for how long, Magnus? When the cash flow's as jumpy as this old ticker of mine, it's getting harder. Maybe like an actor, a stage fight can hit at any age. I meant I know how you find me here in Chicago a couple of months ago in Dallas. You've been using that supposedly failing heart of yours. Suppose you, you want to see a letter from my doctor for pity's sake, my the Embassy Travel Clerk, you've conned him into letting you know when I'm out of town. So you can reach me when the ticker alarm Magnus, goes off. Magnus, I need help. Honest to God, I'm ill and I'm failing. I, I could go all the way down this time. You've got connections. You've got power. I could use my connections to put you in jail and then have you deported and put in another jail in England. You. Twisted, ungrateful little shit. Who paid for that education? That suit? That accent? As for your grandson, if you so much as try to lay your eyes on my boy, I would use my connections to have you shot. No, I didn't say that. I did not threaten to kill my father. Why is the burn box on top of the filing cabinet? It was here on the floor between my feet. Anyway... Killing him isn't enough. I know that now. What happened to the people he betrayed? Magnus hates bloodshed. He always made that clear. That never stopped people shedding blood. Is he a communist? No, that's ridiculous. Well, is he a capitalist? Is that ridiculous? My understanding is that your husband is attracted only to human beings, not to ideas at all. And such an imitator of so many human beings. I have looked at him sometimes and thought, Sir Magnus, that is my nickname for him. Who are you? How many bits and pieces of other people do you assemble to create 
forgive me. Where was I? Your understanding. Ah. Human beings. What about one human being? His mother has crossed my mind. He told me that ten, twelve years ago, he rescued her from some institution, set her up in a nice little house by the sea. He talked about the walks and picnics on the beach, how she loved the church clock chimes, how much he enjoyed taking care of her garden. Too obvious? Yes. Jack Brotherhood's people have been there. Nothing. So, you don't know where he is, and neither do I. Why am I here? I have tried to persuade Magnus several times to come over to us. The game has grown too dangerous for you. I told him this back in America. And a few months ago on Lesbos. And he always refused. So I had the idea that you and your son might care to start a new life in Czechoslovakia. What? Then Magnus would be strongly tempted to join you. I have even here passports and other papers for you. Good God! I know, I know. Absurd. You are not defector material. <laughs> and your son, Tom to uproot him from home and school. But think of this. Tom with a disgraced father in prison for life. And as Magnus's wife, you would be given a fine home. And there are nowadays excellent schools in Czechoslovakia. Utterly absurd. Yes, it is. But as you know, so is much else in our business. Listen. I have not only worked with your husband for 30 years. I have loved him that long. If brotherhood takes him, it may be more than a lifetime in prison. He may not survive. Mary, this is the truth. Magnus coming over to us is the only way he can be saved. Poppy! Poppy! Where are you, Poppy? Who is Poppy, Sir Magnus? There you are. You're Poppy. It's a name I give you sometimes, only to myself. In remembrance. Dear Poppy. You are very drunk and very loud. It's Independence Day. We're free to be noisy and drunk. Now, I must tell you... Magnus, listen, we have to get out. Out where? Out of America. We have stayed too long and been too greedy. The clever Yanks at Langley and their clever computers have begun to see a pattern. There is no pattern. Never was. Our signatures, Sir Magnus, our tracks and traces, they have begun to follow them. And we must run. Nonsense. Where was I? Ah, uh, yes. I told you that when my father died, they laid him in the bath, had him on ice, because they couldn't afford a funeral. But I didn't tell you the rest. Your, your father? I didn't tell you the worst part. I've told no one. I can only tell you, Poppy. Magnus! So here it is. There he was, in the Magnus, bar. I didn't know your father had died. You didn't tell me. No! Of course not, because he isn't. Oh, where was I? Yes, where are you, Sir Magnus? The embassy burn box is back where it was, on the floor between my feet. I assume I fetched it back, but I have no memory of doing so. I do remember pacing the floor, like a prisoner measuring his cell. But I'm not in prison. I can walk out of here any time I want. I'm free to go. A furniture van, but with no company name. Call it Lemons, package for Canterbury. Uh, sit down, Jack. And it could be the destination, or it could be the name Pim choosing. He had a fondness for places as cover names. Mr. Hull, Cover Wentworth, no Canterbury. Jack. The package was his father's old filing cabinet. The book was a match. Simplicissimus. It was their code book. And Mary has disappeared. She took a walk in the garden at some women's meeting. Vanished. She was traced to the Imperial Hotel in Vienna, but she was gone. Didn't check out. Another vanishing. She's good. She knows the game. And we've just heard she may have been on an early flight to London this morning or a late flight to Berlin last night. So she could be here, there, or somewhere else. <laughs> As you say, she's good. Can she have known all along? She convinced me she didn't. Well, nearly enough. You can never be sure. No choice now. A general alert. His photograph to every police station in the country, then the press. 
I have to be there. When you take him, I have to be there. Because of what's in the burn box. It's not names and code names have you worried so much. Magnus will have them in his head anyway. I worked out what else must be in there. So sorry to disturb, Nigel, uh, but Mrs. Pym, she says she has something dreadfully... Excuse me. Mary! I had more trouble getting into an office in London than I had outwitting all of you in Vienna. Where the hell have you been? At a meeting with my husband's partner in crime. He said Magnus told him that he'd put his mother in a house by the sea. He doesn't have a mother. But there's a place in Devon, Farley Abbott. He spoke about it in our early days like a, a boyhood dream of the English heaven. He even sang the praises of the bloody church clock. He hasn't mentioned it for years, but... That's where he is now. I'm sure of it. And he's with a woman. Farley Abbott. And I have to be there. Uh, she's a Miss Dubber. 82 years old, lived here most of her life, and has been running a small boarding house for the last 30 years. Mr. Pym, under the name of Canterbury, has stayed with her many times, beginning quite a number of years ago. Ten years. Thank you, Superintendent. Maybe twelve. Mr. Canterbury, uh, Mr. Pym, helps with the garden, does odd jobs and shopping for Miss Dubber. He's well-liked in the community. He's always well-liked, everywhere. Of course you know Magnus, don't you? The first thing Mary would ask. What about all the people you betrayed? Agents, informers, bystanders? What happened to them? Would you have the sheer gall to tell her you insisted from the start how much you hated bloodshed? If you did, you'd know you've really lost your magical gift of plausibility. Then again, she would have a bit of a cheek even asking that question. Mary knows the game. It's rules. It's shifting rules. It's cost. She's a spy herself. They're out there, Magnus like foxes in the alleys and cats on the roofs. But brave boys, one and all. Now be brave yourself and get that burn box open. If we're able to set up phone communication with your husband, you'll be willing to talk to him? Of course I will. I'll tell him to get himself out here and stop making himself so bloody ridiculous. In the meantime, madam, perhaps you'd like to wait in the church hall? Quite a number of locals in there, safe and warm. Mary? No, she's fine where she is. You mustn't start your engine, sir. So, no heater. And it could be all night. Then I'll sit here and freeze and watch the tidy little garden of his cosy little house. Why the hell did you bring that filing cabinet here? You haven't even opened it. Forget it. Nothing in there but junk. No explanation, no justification, no absolution. So just get on with it. The burn box. First key. Turn. Turn again. And remove. Second key. Turn anti-clockwise. Well done. Now draw out that lovely hideous thing and get it loaded and cocked. Then it's stripped down naked for you, my lad, and get yourself across that corridor and into that bathroom. Yes, Superintendent. Question from the roof, sir. Do we know the type and calibre of weapon Mr. Pym is alleged to have in his possession? Standard Browning, 38 automatic. He's not a maniac. He's not going to come out guns blazing. He'll have one magazine, maybe a spare. His marksmanship? Well. He's been trained, but he's never fired a gun in anger. Because he doesn't get angry. Has he ever taken anybody prisoner? Us. All of us. What do you think you look like, sitting there on the edge of the bath, stark naked except for a towel as a hood and another as a cape? But yes, if there's one thing Miss Dubber hates, it's a mess, so let's keep it to a minimum. No, don't panic. The bath behind you is empty. The one your father was in was another bath altogether, long ago, far away, lying on his bed of ice, laid out by those two sad old lovelies, 
Rose and Lily, was it? Why didn't you close his eyes? Don't panic. Lean into the gun. But his eyes are open. Oh, we did close them, love, but they opened again. Afraid so, Magnus, they would keep opening. And here we are without a penny in the house. Lean in, as if you're trying to catch a still, small voice. The whisper of God. My father's wide eyes, dead as glass, cold as ice, burning me with anger and resentment and love and the gleam of a flick knife. Killing him isn't enough. In A Perfect Spy by John le Carre, dramatised for radio by Robert Forrest, Magnus was played by Julian Ryan tutt Axel by Anton Lesser, Mary, Ruth Gemmel, Jack, Bill Patterson, Rick, Michael Maloney, Kate, Tracy Wiles, Georgie, Samara McLaren, Fergus, Tom Stewart, Nigel, Gerard McDermott, Caroline, Aoife McMahon, Sid Lemon and the police superintendent, Ewan Bailey, and Tom by Adam Thomas Wright. Other parts were played by the cast. A Perfect Spy was a BBC Scotland production directed by Bruce Young. <laughs>